We're going to begin our Bible class today. Um, it's a joy to be with you as we gather for uh, the study of God's Word. We are cont- we're continuing our study um, through uh, the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys. Um, two orders of business first. I found out somebody in this room has a birthday. It's Jamie. Happy birthday, Jamie. Yeah, yeah. Um, What a joy. So I hope your day is fantastic. Second thing, uh, there is a new schedule. Why is there a new schedule, I ask? Because your pastor uh, made a mistake. You have an imperfect pastor. Yeah, I know. and uh, now, now all the errors are corrected. This should be a better uh, um, study now. We would have been all kinds of wrong. Um, so you have a new schedule. So take your old schedule, crump it up, throw it away, burn it, whatever you need. Okay. But we're going to pray and we're going to dive in today. Because uh, there's some really good things that we need to learn in here in our text. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have given the church the task to share the gospel. May, Lord God, now, as we study your word, you teach us your ways, that we would learn them, grow in them, and then go as you have called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Uh, chapter 13, verse 13. Everybody get out. If you don't have a map, that's okay. But if you have a map, get out your map. Um, Paul and Barnabas are off. They are now moving from Paphos to Perga. Uh, this is uh, verse 13. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. Interesting here, you have different things. You, you know, you have what Pamphylia. Well, that's a region, okay? Kind of like our, um, kind of like our uh, counties, okay? We live in a county, Jackson County. Well, when it says Pamphylia, we're really referring to a section, a region, uh, what we would term county. Some are bigger, some are smaller. And so, first goes to Perga. If you note on the map, they would have sailed into Italia. Italia was a port city, important port city. Okay, Um, There would be a lot of trade, um, all kinds of happenings. And so they would sail in, and then from there, move on. Um, So we're in Perga, which is the capital of Pamphylia, okay? Kind of like you have the the, um, county seat, okay? Um, And Pamphylia was five miles inland, 12 miles from Attila, or Talia, okay? There's a note here that John has left. Um, This is John Mark. Uh, Interesting note about John Mark. Same, it was the gospel writer. Um, It is known that there in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you read the the Gospel of Mark, you get to that Garden of Gethsemane point. There's this child, boy, that um, like flees naked. Naked as a jaybird, okay? Um, gets his garment taken, torn. You know, he's trying to run away. I, I can picture, you know how boys are curious. You know, I can just picture him, oh, there's stuff happening. He's probably breaking curfew. I don't know this. I'm, you know, but you can just picture, he's like out there peering behind an olive tree. You know, what's going on? Well, it said that boy was John Mark. Okay. Um, and that's written in the gospel because the writer of the gospel was an eyewitness to it. And that mark there was an eyewitness, okay? So you get more of what happened, why there was this sending of 
John Mark away later in Acts. It's a significant issue, but we're not talking about it today. Um, but just note that. Um, and and uh, in fact, it, it causes a split between Paul and Barnabas. Okay. Acts, what is it, 15, 37? Okay. So they, they stay in Perga. We don't really know what happened in Perga because uh, it quickly moves on to Pis Pisidian. Well, what is Pisidian? Okay, it's named after Antiochus, uh, which is king of Syria. So after the death of Alexander the Great, things went haywire. Okay, it just did, and people took regions and stuff like that. And you had this Antiochus, uh, king of S Syria. And so what happens when you get, become king? You get a city named after you. Okay, here's a city. <laughs> here's a city. Um, and so that's what happened. It's named after this king. And it's 110 miles from Perga. So they would have to walk, you know, more than likely, from uh, Perga to Pisidian. Well, in Pisidian, it, it's quite fascinating because there's a, there's a mixed population there. Okay? It's mixed, uh, most certainly a large Jewish population. In the intertestamental period, uh, there was a point where uh, there was this di diaspora. Uh, it's like another one where a bunch of uh, Jewish people f went, left Israel and went and settled in different places. Okay. And so you have a large settlement of a Jewish population in Pisidian. Thus, a synagogue, which is going to come in play in a minute. But you also, it's a Roman colony. And when it comes to Roman colonies, what they would do is that they would um, put in retired military men. You know, they need a place to go. And so they have this, um, they use these cities and this, so there's a large contingent of Roman, um, Roman people there as well. So a point for today, there, it's mixed crowd, okay? Mixed crowd. And that's going to come into play here when Paul starts preaching. Uh, very significant. Okay. So we, we get here, uh, they, and it says this, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. Okay. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hands said, this is interesting because that's really not the custom of a synagogue. In a synagogue, you would read the scroll and then you'd sit down to teach. <laughs> and Paul doesn't do that. He, he gets up and he's animated. He's motioning with his hands, okay? You, you start to see kind of Paul's preaching style in, in, in this sermon and in the way he goes about things, which is interesting because as we read this, you'll see how people respond to his preaching. Uh, some respond positively, some respond negatively. Uh, but then he has this sermon, and I'm going to read you the full sermon. And I want you to listen and hear. Try to figure out what the law is, what the gospel is. What is Paul's point? What is he trying to achieve? What is he arguing for? And, and really try to pick those things up. What's the central message that Paul is trying to proclaim to these people? Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. 
And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart. Who will do, who will do all my will? Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, son of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come with, up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. Those are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it was written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessing of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that though this man for, though through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish. For I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells you. That's the sermon. Whoa. What was Paul's, what was Paul's argument? What do you think? He's bold, he's very much bold. Different strategy. His point is, where is there forgiveness? Where is freedom from the law of Moses? It's in Jesus Christ. Now how did he get there? He started with what was familiar, what was known. Every good Jewish person knew what? Their history. They knew is Israel and Egypt. They knew the prophets. They knew the kings. And so Paul, as he's preaching and proclaiming this message, starts what they're familiar with and then weaves it to Jesus. And then he fortifies the message with what? Scripture. 
He quotes Psalm 2-7. That's the first one. You are my son today, I have begotten you. Then he quotes Isaiah 55-3. I will give you the holy and true blessing of David. Remember, connecting to what he just said, King David. And then he gives Psalm what is 16-10. And then he ends with Hebrew, um, Habakkuk 1-5 as a warning. And then he uses scripture to fortify his message. And now he, you know, he does, the, the gospel is right there in verse 38. Proclaim to you, um, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. That's the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ is that he came to forgive sins. That is the, the um, there's two, when we look at the gospel, it's all of the person working of Jesus Christ. And then the narrow sense is the forgiveness of sins. So you have the wide sense of the gospel, is the whole person and work of Jesus, and, and all of those um, things that involve that. But the very crux of it is forgiveness. Okay? And this is what he preaches. And he leaves them with the law. He gives them a warning. Don't be like the scoffers. Okay? Don't be like the scoffers. And... It's quite fascinating to me what happens. Listen to this. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. It makes me think. Paul goes into, he is living in a world that Christianity is in, in its infancy. Okay? Now, the, the beautiful thing is that they have a history. Christianity has a history. It's all of the history of the Jews, right? We have the Old Testament that really lends itself to that, but Christianity, you know, is, is in its infancy here. We're talking 47 AD. Okay? Note how, where he starts, he goes into where? The synagogue. He uses to his advantage things that are already in place. And he goes in there and preaches with boldness this message of forgiveness. Okay? It makes me think Paul's world was very Roman, very much filled with, you know, idolatry, um, syncretism. It didn't matter what god you worshipped, you know. That's the Greeks, right? That's what Greeks brought to the to the table. You can worship whatever, okay? Which there was this war going on between, you know, this Greek culture that has pervaded in there. Of course, Caesar. Uh, is you know claims to be God, and then this so there's this whole subsect of battling between Jews and Romans, okay? In um, you know when it comes to religion, now you got Paul on the scene preaching the gospel, the gospel, and of course it, it's now more to it, okay? But he starts with where they're at, and this has been interesting. How has Church has changed, hasn't it? I'm not talking about doctrine. I'm not necessarily talking about practice. But how has church changed from when you were a kid to today? Has it changed? Am I not, am I completely lost here? I think your basic beliefs have changed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, 
look at if you look at down on, in verse 44, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city closed. Yep, absolutely. And it's it's very said, different. This had to be something that yeah. was really tremendous. Right. Um, and, and I think probably if I think back to when I was a kid, uh, I had a little about 10 or 12 years ago. Oh! <laughs> 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 in the church I grew up in, we had all kinds of Sunday school contests and all kinds of door knocking and things yep. like that that you don't see that today so much. Right. When you so was church and religion a primary function of the culture when you were growing up? Yes. Today is it the primary function of the culture? No. We've seen a drastic shift. Okay? And this is important for us to to understand because in fact church we are in a time that we don't know how to handle. We don't. And usually the LCMS is like 15 years behind everybody else. Um, we are living in a post-Christian culture. We are living in a pagan culture. Period. We can't get around it. Wouldn't it be nice to live in the days of the heyday of Lutheranism? 1950s and 60s, heyday of Lutherans, as most Lutherans in America. The harsh reality is that we're not going back to that. We can't go backwards. Okay? And now the ch what the church is wrestling with is how to be church in the midst of a culture that we're not used to. Well, that's a good point. How do we engage on this? Because what it's looking like around us is the eroding of everything that we hold dear. Morals, values, beliefs in Jesus, all kinds of things. And it's infuriating, isn't it? Right? It makes you sick. Very me-centered. Very me-centered, yeah. We live in a very me-centered culture. So now we as church have been trying to figure out how to be church in the midst of this mess. And it's really hard because you have certain church bodies that have done what? Left the scriptures and caved to the, to the culture, right? You see this eroding. How do we be faithful in the midst of a culture that now hates us. We have a few options. Okay? We can move inward, isolate, and be like the Amish. We can, right? That's, that's an option. Correct? Well, that's not, it's not the right answer. <laughs> right? We could conform to the ways of the world. But that's not the right answer either. So how do we stand upon our faith and our doctrines and our beliefs and still share the gospel to other people? I myself have res wrestled with this. I've been in churches where there is a long-standing history of Lutheranism and, I, and in communities where, you know, up in Wausau, there was five, six, five LCMS churches within a five-mile radius. Then you add on every other church body. Highly Lutheran up there. And this whole engaging, I, 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 reject, I reject the title of millennial. Even though I'm technically one, I don't like it. <laughs> I prefer the title of elder millennial. Did you know that the, next, the, af, the generation after Millennial is one of the largest generations there is now. And it is the most um, unchurched generation there is. So we have to think about how to do this. There's a church in Ann Arbor. It's the, the, the chapel of 
Ann Arbor. I forgot what it's called. What's it called, Craig? University, University Lutheran Chapel. A friend of mine from seminary, Gabe Casper, is the pastor there. Gabe and Marcus. And they live on the front lines of engaging the culture every day. Okay? And so I sat in, I sat in a, um, at the last conference, like, okay, I need to understand this a little bit better. How do you do it? And so what they do is their preaching is very different than what we would typically hear for a Sunday. They start where we can agree upon in the culture. Something we can agree upon. I'll give you an example in a minute because I, I tried this. Okay? And then they get to Jesus, kind of like what Paul did. He starts with where they're at and then moves and brings in Jesus and then upholds it with the scriptures. Okay? I tried this out. As you know, I went back to Nebraska a few weeks ago, uh, before, right after Thanksgiving, and I had a funeral there. My sister-in-law lost her mother very, she died of a massive heart attack. Very similar to what happened to my mother. Um, and I knew I was walking into a situation where people have not known Jesus for a long time. Haven't heard the gospel for a long time. And so what am I going to do? How am I going to start this? And I thought about what Gabe said. Where's the common ground? What, what, what would they know? What's common ground where I can start? And I, and I started with an Ed Sheeran song. Anybody know who Ed Sheeran is? Yeah, a few, okay. Tell you what, if you listen to this song, grab a box of tissues, you're going to need it. The song's entitled Marketplace Flowers. Hits me in the feels every single time. It's about how he lost his grandma, I believe. And in there was a verse it said, a heart that's been broke is a heart that's been loved. I can agree to that. So I took what was common, because you know we're dealing with people who are well versed in the culture, and I started with that. And you should have, Ed Sheeran, you just said Ed Sheeran, that guy with the clerical collar on? <laughs> didn't know I knew who that was, did you? <laughs> I didn't say that in the sermon. <laughs> I started with that lyric verse, and I said, there's a lot of broken hearts here. It's because you guys have hearts that have been loved by Maureen, and you've loved Maureen. And I gave examples of what that looks like for them. And then I said, who can heal this broken heart? Who can do the mending? Because it really doesn't, it, it feels like it's never going to get mended. Well, there's one in the scriptures that says, I bind up the brokenhearted. And that's Jesus. And I got to Jesus through that way. And I was dumbfounded how responsive these people who haven't heard the gospel for a very long time, how responsive they were. People talked about it for days. My brother, who I dearly love, he said, you know, we were talk they were still talking about your sermon. Really? It begs the question, how will we, as Redeemer Lutheran Church, continue to stand firm on the scriptures and doctrine and then go share in Jesus with People who do not know. Things, we're told in scripture that things aren't going to get better. Good thing we had that revelation course, right? thanks. <laughs> <laughs> How will we go about sharing. How will we use the gifts that God has given us? This is my sermon today. How will we give the resources that Christ has bestowed upon us? What can we do to 
continue to share the gospel. This is something that each of us needs to wrestle with. And it's something that the staff here wrestles with almost on a daily basis. Why do you think we're doing um, worship, grow, and serve? Our Ephesians 4. Because it talks about equipping the saints to do work, to do what? The work of the ministry. And so, let's be about this together. And the fact of the matter is that we're going to have opposition. In this world, we will have tribulation. What does Paul receive when he's preaching here at Pisidia? Pisidian. Some believe, some don't. Listen to this. The next Sabbath, the whole city gathered, which is fascinating to me. Wouldn't it be awesome if the whole Jackson showed up? But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It is necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you thrust it aside and judge between yourselves unworthy of eternal life. You see, they're the ones that rejected Jesus and threw everything aside. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Paul has to preach to the Jews first, and then the Gentiles. He's fulfilling what was commanded him. For the Lord has also commanded us, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. The Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many were appointed to eternal life, believed. But then the Jews incited riots and stuff, stirred up persecution. Verse 51, But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. There is opposition to the gospel. I don't know if you know this, but on social media today, there are people that get on social media and use the platforms to speak against the church. There's a movement in our culture today called deconstruction, where people are actively deconstructing their faith and in fact rejecting the faith. And not only is it for them, but then they have this mission, this militant mission, to then help others deconstruct theirs. And so you have on social media people railing against the church today as we speak. That's where we're seeing a lot of opposition. We have to be aware of that. Okay, one, now you are. Two, we have to pray for people. We have to, there, there is an active attack on the Christ and his word. And you know what's sad? People are believing it. Believing it. People who wear these things are preaching a false gospel every day. I t and, and, and nothing's new on their son, and it's all, all things the church has dealt with in the past, docetism and all kinds of heresies that are out there. They're just, it's being revisited because why? Because they weren't taught right. And they, and, or they were taught right and they rejected the faith and so if you have kids and grandkids you know it's, be, be aware it's accessible on social media so how do we do this how, how, how and I think also church culture has played a part into it, to, to negatively our, our culture especially in the last 30 years has lent itself to becoming soft in my opinion I'm going to be honest with you where we have for, it, for the sake of love we've compromised 
doctrine and practice. What is the, the church, I, th I think about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We're to be gentle. When you're gentle, you can also be firm. So, there are going to be people who argue for, there, there's people arguing that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. There are people are, you know, demanding evidence. I'm not going to believe until you show me. Okay, Thomas. Right? That's what Thomas did. And in a group of pastors, this argument was taking place. And it's all about faith. Time out. Faith is important, but are there evidences of, this, of Christ in the scriptures? Did you know that 95% of archaeology confirms the biblical record? 95%. Caiaphas, the guy, the chief high priest that put, you know, was there doing, you know, executing the, 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 the cruci you know, he's there railing against Christ and saying crucify, crucify. They found his tomb. They found his tomb, yeah. Yeah, you know, Yeah. You know, just Absolutely. Back to that's that's the Bible too. The answers in Genesis stuff, right? You know, they say, oh, you know, it can't be possible, right. but then they find stuff like that, and it's like, <laughs> go back. Right. It just says it right in Genesis. The water. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you, if you read the scriptures, you can actually find the places. You can go to the places physically. Go to the places that are written here. Okay. History also confirms the biblical record. Um, uh, Josephus, he was Jewish and Roman. So he has nothing to do with Christianity, right? He was a historian there in the late, uh, you know, first century. He, he writes on the, the, the burning of, of Jerusalem and the walls going down again. And that happened late, like, nine, what is it, 98 or something? I can't remember the date. But he writes about Jesus and his resurrection. I have it on my shelf. It's right there. This guy who wasn't a Christian writes about the resurrection of Jesus. Whom? Everybody out there holds to be one of the finest historians of early first century. Hmm. We live in a world that only wants the science to speak for with what they want. And now they have a, what's a scientific discipline? Archaeology. What's, what's history? History is held in high, high esteem. So we, we have these things out there and there will be people who will be hard-hearted to the reception of the gospel. It comes down to what's our job? What is our job as the church? Proclamation. Proclamation. Pastor hits the nail on the head. I struggled with this because I've heard from the pulpit many different places that it is our job to advance the kingdom. I can barely advance myself to church on Sunday. No, not joking. Not even joking. Not even joking. What's the first question you and I ask each other on Sunday morning? How are you? Yeah, right. <laughs> struggling. Um, <laughs> whose job is it to... Uh, the, here's the thing about the kingdom. Christ has already ushered in the kingdom. The kingdom is already here. He's already ruling and reigning. And it's the Holy Spirit's job for people to come in. But it's our job to proclaim Jesus to others, to make him known. 
So that faith comes by what? Hearing and the hearing of the word of God. And so we have to get understand what our role is so that we can do it. Christ has already established the kingdom and his kingdom will come in full, full regalia at the end. But we are to be faithful. It really, really begs the question, is the church being faithful? Okay? And that's something we have to rest. I, th I think we're doing the best job we can with what we have. Can we make improvements? By all means. I can improve. I can be a better preacher. I, I'm trying. I'm actually doing a lot of study. Okay? But think about this. Because guess what? And I'm going to end on this. We still have the same Holy Spirit that led Paul out there to Pisidian to preach the good news to a whole bunch of people in a synagogue. We have the same Holy Spirit who has brought millions and millions to faith throughout the generations. If we for just a moment forget how powerful our God is, we're in trouble. And so, my prayer for us in this place, I've been praying for our church and our circuit, how awesome would it be to have two healthy, fantastic, awesome congregations in Jackson, us in Trinity, proclaiming the gospel together. More the merrier, right? Amen. But not just our congregations, and I prayed this in our prayers, but our circuit, and we pray for the repentance of other churches, that they would come back home. There needs to be somewhat of an urgency to all this. One, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. We don't. It's up to, it's up to the, our Lord. Actually, the Father, because He knows. But we don't know when our time is done on earth. And as soon as we take our final breath, we no longer preach. My prayer is that, the, for me personally, that Christ's word is coming out of my lips until that very final breath. Whether I'm in a nursing home with my children looking atop of me, Or in some other fashion. I, I, I'm so glad we're doing Acts because it really shows us. So let's just application here. How can you do this where you're at? Well, do you have people you talk to that aren't of faith? What's some common ground you can start with? Be praying for an opportunity to share. Somebody comes up, oh, my wife left me. That happens. You can be that listening ear. And then you can, as you listen, to understand. It's, you know, I would love to pray for you. But I also, I have some really good news. Jesus knows your suffering. And he truly cares. That's just one example. Okay? Thanks be to God, it's Christ's kingdom and not ours. And what thank about that? Yes, bring it to me. Uh, I would argue that the members of the congregation are much better evangelists than the pastor. Yeah. Stop and think. Yeah. People expect the pastor. To invite you to church. Yep. And they sometimes even see it kind of as self centered when you just want the bigger church. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So the members of the congregation invite the neighbor or acquaintances. Yeah. That has a greater impact. Amen. 
And we're going to end on that wisdom. Thank you. Because it's true. It's true. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, Heavenly Father, for the Apostle Paul. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. Thank you for this church. Thank you, Lord God, that you have called us to bear the gospel. May we, collectively and as individuals, remain faithful until the very end. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Peace be with you. Have a wonderful day.